So I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll kick off. So I'm Leanne Hirschfield. I'm uh, Associate Research Professor uh, at ICS here at CU Boulder. Uh, my lab, the Shine Lab. So we're very much HCI human computer interaction like you guys, um, a lot of you guys are. And I'll kind of give you an overview of our research today. So feel free to stop, you know, if you have any questions throughout, feel free to jump in, but also at the end, there'll be plenty of time and um, you can ask any questions you have um, throughout. Okay, so today I'll go, I'll give you guys kind of a bird's eye view of kind of what we do in, in our lab. We'll talk a little bit about the human brain and um, I'll tell you guys a bit about how FNIRS works, which is the main uh, brain measurement device that we use in our lab. But we also use a whole bunch of other physiological sensors and behavioral sensors. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of tell you about those sensors as well. I'll tell you about three projects that we have going on right now. Um, for the most part, um, they're all in the human performance domain. Um, some work we have on kind of human agent teams that I think might be of interest to you guys. Um, I'll talk about some work we're doing um, with the, the US Air Force Academy, um, training pilots in virtual reality and some fun stuff we have going on there. And then I'll tell you about our new uh, Institute on Student AI Teaming that is you know, right here at, at CU Boulder, which we are so excited that we um, have this institute kicking off, uh, kicked off actually a couple months ago and we are off and running. So I'll tell you guys about that as well. So quickly, just this uh, background about me and uh, on the side here, you have, I have two, my husband, Ben, and, and two kids here, Jay and Annie. Jay is four and in daycare and Annie is in fifth grade here in Boulder. Um, and, and just a little bit of background of kind of my, my background where I came from. So I did my PhD at Tufts University. So I don't know if anyone in HCI has worked with Rob Jacob. Rob is over, over there on the left. and. Um, definitely helped to kind of, um, you know, form, form the way that I view research. Um, you know, Rob had a big part of that. And um, next to him is someone named Sergio Fantini, who is also at Tufts, and he's actually a biomedical engineer. And, uh, and I wanted to take a moment, because Atlas, I know you guys are so, so interdisciplinary, and you're really visionaries and pushing the boundaries. So I wanted to take a minute and, um, and tell you that about 15 years ago, while I was doing my PhD at Tufts, we would always talk about how surveys, you know, if we wanted to get user experience or find out if a technology, you know, frustrated people or if they had a high workload while they were working with the technology, at the time we would have to give surveys, right? And, and this is, you know, the, still we have to often give surveys and, um, you know, and gather things like speed and accuracy. Um, while I was uh, doing my PhD at Tufts, probably in about 2006, my advisor, Rob Jacobs said, you know, I hear about a guy in biomedical engineering, he's creating some sort of new brain measurement device, you know, like he's a, and, and it's called FNIRS, I've never heard of it, you know, but like, you know, maybe go talk to him. And so I went to this Sergio Fantini, who, who is a biomedical engineer and a physicist. I went to his office, like a crazy PhD student. And I said, you know, um, do you think you could use your device to, you know, to measure something like workload in the brain. And he said, that's insane, that's absurd. Like, no way, we're still validating the device. So, you know, and he was really working to make sure that the device was actually getting good brain activity. And I remember spending an hour with him and saying, you know, well, theoretically, if the device does get brain, brain data, which is what he was focused on, you know, theoretically, you know, the prefrontal cortex is related to workload. And so, so theoretically, would it be possible? And I remember him saying, yeah, I suppose it would be. Like, I suppose if we are getting good brain data, you know, that, that it would be possible. Um, and things have just, you know, that was like the beginning of this kind of wild ride um, to the research that we do in our lab. But also you guys throughout the, um, this talk, you guys are gonna see some really advanced FNIRS devices. And at the time when we started, um, you know, we could measure, they're holding a device in their hand, we could measure like two areas on the brain and it had these huge wires hooked to it and, and these optical fibers and things have moved so quickly in 15 years. And, um, and so I just wanted to take a minute and point that out. Like, it's like so fun to be, um, to be pushing the envelope. And, and it's been neat in my career to actually see how quickly these things do move and it's fun to be at the front line of it. So 
Um, and we were among the first groups to do machine learning with FNIR's data. And so it's just, it's neat. And I wanna like tell you guys, like you're all in the right area. And if it feels crazy, like a wild ride, that's how it should, you know, that's how it should feel, so. So the research we do in the lab, you know, very much human performance, you know, our goal is to, um, to, to improve or optimize human performance. Um, the contexts change. Sometimes, you know, this could be um, pilots, you know, learning to fly. It could be students in a classroom. Um, it could be, you know, um, people working in teams and human agent teaming kind of scenarios. Um, you know, we blend, you know, within our lab, we blend a lot of different areas of expertise. So we certainly, we have a lot of social science that goes on. Some folks that are really into machine learning and um, the algorithm side of things. Um, we have a lot of cog psych people and, uh, and neuroscience people that we work with. And so um, our best work comes from, you know, a table with a range of points of views, range of expertise, and, you know, everyone finds a way to have a common, common language. And that's how we kind of work together to produce some good research. Um, so most of our work is either focused on one of these two items. So um, classification, so measuring uh, social, cognitive, and, you know, and affective states is it, we want to make these predictions, classification in real time. So we use a lot of different machine learning techniques to try to predict someone's, um, you know, social, cognitive, affective state. Um, and then the other piece is we're getting much more these days into reinforcement learning also. So like actually trying to build out systems where, you know, you could classify states in real time, but then what's a good intervention, you know, and what's a good, you um, you know, action that you can take. So um, those are kind of, you know, a bird's eye view of kind of what we do. So I'll give a quick um, overview of kind of different brain measurement devices. So here on the on the left side, you see this is um, a generic picture of someone wearing an EEG. Um, in the middle, you've got an fMRI scanner. And on the side there, you have a, a one version of a FNIRS device. This is the Hitachi ETG 4000 on the right side. Um, so the way that the the way that the brain works at a really high high level is, um, you know, you'll first have some sort of stimulus. So it could be like me clapping my hands, right? The, a stimulus occurs, or a light turns on, or someone starts your phone rings. Um, those are all examples, right, of a stimulus. Um, immediately when that happens, the neurons fire in your brain, and that's within you know really really quickly that that occurs. The neurons start firing. Um, they create these electrical potentials which is what's measured by EEG. So EEG has really fast, what we call temporal resolution. It's getting those neurons immediately after a stimulus occurs. Um, when the neurons are firing in the brain, um, basically what happens, you actually have, uh, the neurons are firing and they're taking up energy and they need more energy. And so um, blood starts to flow towards the area where the neurons are firing. And that's a much slower response. So it's like related to this bold signal that some who are um, neuroscientists would know about. Or, and that's um, the fMRI is a great example of getting um, this, this kind of slow information about uh, blood movement in, in the brain. Um, and so FNIRS actually measures this similar information to what fMRI gives you. So FNIRS measures um, the, the change in oxygenated, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood flow in your brain. Um, the neat thing about FNIRS is that um, you're getting similar data to what you get in an fMRI scanner, but you're getting it clearly outside the scanner while people are working in naturalistic contexts. So, um, so the FNIRS is definitely um, the device I've worked with the most, and I'll tell you more about that as we go. But that's kind of an overview of the different brain measurement devices out there. So the way FNIRS works is uh, near-infrared light gets pulsed into the brain. Um, it's at six, normally within a, a particular window, usually 690 and 830 nanometers, like gets pulsed into the brain. And then you actually have a powerful light detector that is getting the light that goes into your brain. It takes this kind of banana shape. So the light goes into the, your brain and comes back out and the light detector picks up the light that's reflected back out. Um, Based on the information about the detected light at these two wavelengths, um, you can tell information about the deoxygenated and oxygenated blood flow in the brain. Um, the FNIRS device has been really, really great, um, as I say, for research in, in human computer interaction, social sciences. Um, it's really non-invasive, easy to set up, takes 
literally just a couple minutes to set up. So EEG, if anyone's ever worked with EEG, can take a long time to get the gel um, working. We, we use EEG in the lab and it, it's useful for you know a lot of scenarios. But anyways, but FNIRS is a lot quicker to set up, um, generally more comfortable to wear. And for our research, probably one of the, the most important pieces is that um, FNIRS gets much better spatial resolution than EEG does. So with our FNIRS devices, with high density FNIRS devices, I should say, um, we're able to get specific information about brain regions that are activated you know, during these kind of HCI tasks. So um, EEG, generally speaking, unless you have a ton of electrodes, isn't able to get that spatial resolution. Um, so again, we're getting the kind of quality of what you would get from the scanner, an fMRI scanner, but we're doing, you know, we're getting that spatial information about activation in the brain, but we're doing it in naturalistic settings. So just to give you a very, very high level overview of some of the fun things that, um, that you might measure, you know, that you might care to measure in HCI um, with, with the brain. So, you know, the frontal lobe up here gives you really good information. It's a lot of executive functioning, a lot of, um, you know, um, kind of traditional problem solving and thinking. And so this is a good sweet spot that we, that we often look at in our studies and clearly relates to workload and, and has been tied to workload um, in, in many scenarios. Um, occipital area back here, the back of the brain, we're actually doing some fun work. I'll show you guys um, where we're trying to look at um, working memory load, but also you could get at things like um, visual perceptual load. So you could be able to tell if someone, for example, is um, having a lot of visual information presented to them by measuring the occipital area. And so if you did need to assist them, you know, you might want to choose to give them an auditory prompt instead of showing them something on the screen that they're not going to see, for example. Um, so anyway, so there, this, on this left side, it kind of shows some of the main functions of the brain. On the right side, um, this, there's a nice uh, paper that um, is here in the Nature Reviews of Neuroscience that really goes into the different um, kind of social processes and the, the different areas that are related to, um, to kind of mentalizing and socializing and feeling emotional. Um, and so this kind of breaks down the different, the different areas. One area that we um, look at a lot is called the TPJ, it's the temporoperiodal junction. It's right here kind of on the sides of your head. And um, it's related to theory of mind processing. So it's social cognition. So if you're thinking about other, other people, like you're maybe thinking about other people's intentions or you're trying to, trying to empathize with others, you know, um, you see a lot of activation in those regions. Um, and so anyways, there's a lot of, and uh, DLPFC, which is another area we can kind of reach is related to emotion regulation. So for example, if someone um, is, you know, really stressed and they're having to like self-regulate to carry on with a task, you may see more activation there. So depending on our study and what we're trying to do, you know, we often have helpful neuroscientists that'll come in and kind of we, we target specific brain regions, you know, depending on what we're looking for. So this is just um, an example of that. Uh, and here's a, a paper that we, that we have that kind of shows this in more detail. But um, th these, these, this picture is giving you an overview of a lot of prior fMRI research that has looked at trust and distrust and kind of suspicion. And so when you're trying to evaluate whether or not you're trusting the information someone's giving you, um, whether it be a human or an automated agent, for example, um, but you'll have activation um, in this TPJ, you know, the social cognition region, but you'll also see um, some of these other brain regions that, that are kind of um, tied to, to whether or not you're trusting someone. Um, it's worth pointing out that uh, in this picture here, the right side is areas that are um, reachable with FNIRs. So FNIRs can only go a few centimeters into the cortex. So deep brain structures, we're, we're not you know, able to get, and that's, that's a problem. Um, we actually have a side study now where we're um, doing a series of tasks in the fMRI scanner, and then we're doing the same tasks with whole head FNIRs. Um, and we're trying to figure out if there's ways that we can kind of infer deep brain activity um, you know, from the FNIRs data. So that's a fun side project. But anyways, it, it's a complication that we can't get deep brain structures, which is where a lot of kind of deep raw emotion kind of occurs. 
So here's, uh, we have so many fun toys in the lab. And I mentioned, you know, in the first slide about just how quickly the FNIRS technology has taken off. But, um, but this here is, um, you know, th these are all different sensors we have in our lab. And um, certainly the, the highlight of the sensors is um, we have these, you know, co completely wearable um, FNIRS devices. We have enough for three people um, to be doing, you know, some sort of teaming uh, uh, at a time. So we have enough units for three people. You can also, one neat thing that you can do is actually combine the, we can do like a full head FNIRS measurement and you can kind of combine the different, the different units together, which is kind of cool. Um, we also have wireless EEG electrodes that we can place within our um, FNIRS montages. So this picture here is um, an example of, so this is showing prefrontal region and then the temporoparietal junction. So for example, if we're looking at, you know, workload and trust while someone's, you know, interacting with the technology, we might pick a montage like this with our FNIRS devices for the measurements. Um, so yeah, so those are our FNIRS devices. We also have Toby Pro glasses, three sets. So we haven't even used them yet, actually. And I'm, um, we've been using desk mounted um, Toby eye trackers. Um, but anyways, we've got these glasses that I'm excited to break out once we can figure out a fun um, kind of, you know, study that involves movement. Um, we have galvanic skin response sensors. So we have three of these, this, um, you can see at the bottom here, uh, this is me piloting um, an experiment in the lab, but I'm wearing a shimmer, uh, it's a wireless galvanic skin response sensor. And so we have three of those. And then we've got heart rate monitors and um, respiration monitors. And so we have a whole bunch of fun toys um, that we use in our studies. So I'll tell you a little bit about some of the projects we have going on now. Um, I don't know if anyone, if you guys know Tom Williams, but he's, uh, he's over at the Colorado School of Mines. Uh, yeah, so, and Tom and I actually are from the same tiny town in, in central New York. And we both did our PhD at Tufts. So he was with, he did, he was HRI and I was HCI. Um, so we had different advisors, but anyways, I know Tom very well. And, um, and so Tom has a lab over at, at School of Mines and he does some really neat uh, HRI work. Um, and then, uh, and this is also uh, working with Chris Wicken. So I'll tell you, I, um, those who know human factors or, um, Kind of IO psychology, but Wickens is kind of wrote the textbook on um, human factors engineering. And so he's actually just out of Fort Collins. Um, and so he works, he comes into Boulder and when when we're able and not, you know, COVID concerns. But um, anyways, he, he's working on this project also. Um, but the idea behind this project is that um, what we want to try to do is imagine that you have you know, someone that's that's working with, the, they're assisted by a robot, they have augmented reality that could assist them as well. Um, and they're wearing a, a slew of sensors, right, of these kind of neurophysio sensors. Um, the question we're looking at is, if we can tell with our sensors what the, the they have either high working memory load or that they have high um, auditory or visual perceptual load, um, the question is, you know, if you can tell that information, you know, this person is, let's say, for example, they have high working memory load um, and, they, and they're maxed out through their auditory channels. Well, then that could be a really great way, you know, if they need help, you could help them by showing them something in their visual channel. So it's kind of a modality, which, which modality do you want to help them, um, help them with? So, um, and so in Tom's lab, you know, they do a lot of the, the he's got Pepper the robot who can help and assist and, um, so anyway, so we're trying to figure out from our point of view, what can we, um, can we accurately measure perceptual, you know, the perceptual load someone is experiencing as well as their working memory load. And then from Tom's point of view, they're interested in like, well, then what do you do? How do you communicate? What's the way to help them if you know what their current state is? So and quickly, uh, Wiccans here, uh, just want some, those of you again, who've done any human factors, um, uh, anything really workload, um, human information processing. So um, Wiccans has, uh, you know, and you should totally, I would, I don't know, suggest everyone should look him up because it's important to, I think he's, um, you know, kind of a, I don't know, such a trailblazer in our field. But anyways, um, he has, these, these are kind of some of his models and theories that a lot of folks know about. So I won't go into a ton of detail, um, but he's done a lot of work on applied attention and 
Um, if someone is maxed out with their visual attention, what's a way to kind of get their get their attention? And um, and he also works a lot with on the bottom right here. You know, he developed what's called multiple resource theory. It's basically just this idea that you know when you're multitasking, you have different channels. You know, where information could be perceived. Then you have kind of cognition of what you're thinking about in the in the brain. You know, while you're processing things. And then you have different responding channels. Are you going to respond? You know. Um, you know, by saying something, or are you going to respond by pointing somewhere? And so um, he has um, a lot of good theory that goes into this project um, that we're working on with him. So what we've done um, in in this uh, in this project is we had worked with with Wiccans to develop a test bed that allows us. So it, uh, the test bed has people doing a simple search and sort task. So it'll say something like um, place blue circles, place the blue circle into bins two and four, for example, right? And so you're dragging and dropping. So it's, yep, exactly. It's a drag and drop kind of um, task. And so, um, and with, within that task, we can manipulate working memory by giving you, and I'll show you a demo of this, um, I think on the next slide, um, but we can manipulate working memory by having you have to recall more bins and some of the bins get grayed out randomly. So you have to, so you have to remember more bins because they may be grayed out. Anyway, so we can manipulate working memory um, by the number of bins that we ask you to, to remember. We can um, manipulate visual uh, perceptual load by changing the saliency of the, of the, you know, of the visual elements that you're looking for. So if everything is, you know, clearly you can see the green green square easily in the top picture, whereas it's harder to pick out the, the red square in the bottom picture because you have more similarities, right, between, and um, this all goes into, you know, kind of visual search load theory and um, perceptual load theory in general. Auditory load also, we manipulate, um, you have actually, uh, I'm wearing down in this uh, picture here, I'm wearing headphones and I'm actually hearing information about, um, I have a call sign, so I'm Bravo in this task. And so I might be doing the primary task where I'm grabbing grabbing green squares and placing them in bins. And at the same time, um, every now and then I'll hear information that says, you know, attention Bravo, please grab, you know, a, a different shape and place it into a different bin. So, and I have to attend to that information. Um, we, we can manipulate auditory load by we're giving distractor information actually on one, headphone and then on the other side we're giving good information and we're also um, sometimes calling like attention delta please move you know uh, shape and you you ignore that because you're not delta your call sign is bravo so anyway so we carefully worked with Wiccans to kind of design this um, this test bed environment and you can see like a uh, with our FNIRS montage here um, these are so we have certain regions that are tied to working memory. Um, in the back is the occipital area. And then off to the sides here, you have regions that are related to auditory load. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, can we tell when, you know, if we, if we put people into these scenarios where we're maxing them out in these different kinds of channels, and we have eight different conditions here, um, can we tell, you know, which, which of those conditions we had them in? So, um, so it's kind of fun. But let's see, oh yeah, so I'll show you guys. So, I don't know if anyone's ever done, um, you know, psychology tasks before, like NBAC tasks or visual search tests. Um, I will tell you that we, uh, I'll, it's going to seem like a lot. I'll play it for you guys. Like, basically, they're, you know, the person is about to see the target shape is green circle. They're told that they can place it in bins two, two or three. So they're going to be grabbing green circles. And it's almost like a conveyor belt, like, Things will be moving, but you're also going to hear tons of auditory information. So it's going to be saying, attention, bravo, place, now grab another shape and place it here. So it's going to be a lot, but um, we've run probably like 60 or 70 participants and actually people are performing quite well. So even though it feels like a ton, if you guys were trained on it, you'd be good. So anyways, I'll show it to you. Bravo. Hotel. Hotel. Attention. Bravo. Would you please Bravo. place any shape into bin number one? Alpha. Hotel. Alpha. Alpha. Attention. 
Alpha, would you please, place alpha. any shape into bin number 4. Alpha. 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 Attention, Alpha. Hotel, would you please, place any shape into alpha. bin number 4. Alpha. Alpha. And you can see the timer counting Dango. down, so we have 60 second chunks. Attention, um, Dango. Hotel. Would you please, place any shape into bin number three. Hotel. And then this was a pilot. We actually changed um, changed the survey, but they built, they do a survey after each one. So let me go away. Okay. So, um, yes, and of course we tweak that and all these, we have like, we think of the workload as different levers that we're kind of tweaking. Um, so anyway, so we're running uh, a ton of data collections right now. So um, kind of, this is kind of where we currently are. So right now we're running a bunch of studies in the lab. I think we're, like I said, I think we have about 60 participants to run, but we want to be at a, about a hundred plus um, to do some reasonable machine learning. Um, but the idea is to really train um, train classifiers to try to predict their level of auditory auditory load, processing load and visual uh, perceptual load as well as working memory load. And so, and then the other piece that Tom Williams is working on um, in parallel is trying to figure out, you know, well, if, if we can tell that information about, you know, someone's mental state, um, what do we do about it? You know, so what's a good communication style? And, and so Tom looks a lot into like, do you, do you help them by saying, you know, place this, place this shape there, and do you point, or do you use like more um, language and say place the green, you know, the green cube in bin two? But and um, so he's kind of looking more into like how do you actually assist? Should you give an AR kind of prompt like highlight something, or should Pepper be helping you? And anyway, so um, and ultimately the eventual goal is to kind of piece the two together. Um, and, and try to build an adaptive system that would that we could test out that would, you know, uh, make a prediction of your mental state, um, and then you know do some sort of uh, intelligent action, you know, based on that. Um, I should add one tricky thing that we're currently trying to figure out is um, model transfer. So, you know, we're using this really simple 2D desktop to to train to get all of our training data for our models. And ultimately, we've been talking about um, trying to then do the same task with augmented reality. Um, the tricky part now is uh, is that the AR we have found, you know, that um, it's just really it, the technology is still very complex to use. So I suspect that even if we have identical tasks in these two environments, I suspect that the P the people in AR do tend to still have a higher load, like across the board, just, just the difference between a 2D desktop and going to the AR environment, you know, and you do have to kind of learn how to use it. So that's one of the things we're kind of currently trying to decide in our minds, like, do we have a shot at, like, how do we do model transfer between these? And so and it's kind of a fun research problem. So, okay, so here's another project we're working on that has kind of some similar flavorings, and this is with um, Sydney DeMello, who is, uh, you guys will hear about him later also because Sydney is the PI on, for the AI Institute. Um, and so, and, and someone named Phil Bobko, who's actually, uh, I've worked with Phil for um, like the last 10 years, and he's an expert in kind of trust, uh, in trust in interpersonal trust as well as trust in teams. And so he brings a kind of human factors, social science flavor um, to the work. But the, um, this project uh, is funded through the Army, and you know the main goal of the project is is to optimize you know human performance, try to predict someone's mental state again using our sensors. You know, so you're looking at maybe what if they're maxed out or if they're you know overloaded in some way or frustrated. But ultimately, it's really focused on making real time adaptations that are trust sensitive. So for example, if someone is maxed out um, and an agent is helping them, if I can tell that they have low trust in that agent, um, there may need to be some trust repair done, right? Um, and there's great techniques out there to try to repair trust, both between human, human trust and human agent trust. Um, and so anyway, so we're building this intelligent system and it's based on reinforcement learning. Um, and, and the idea is that you know um, that it's 
very specifically focused on being um, sensitive to the trust dynamics within the team. And so you're kind of watching how this team is working together. And then you're making, um, when different people have a high cognitive load, for example, you're trying to make good kind of um, trust sensitive decisions, right? On, on how you might assist them. Or maybe you wanna do some sort of task shedding, which is where if someone becomes maxed out, you might shed their task or part of their task to someone else. Perhaps you make sure to shed it to someone that they trust. As, as an easy example. Anyway, so, um, so that's kind of a, like the high level view of, of this project. And so the first thing that we have been kind of working on for the project and um, is, is coming up with kind of a, you know, a, a framework or, you know, if you will, or a process model of trust, trust sensitive human agent teaming. So this is really going through like the massive amount of literature on you know um, interpersonal you know human human teams and human agent teams and and what are the main kind of looking at what are the main um, kind of team states what are the main individual states that that kind of are important in the literature um, and again what the focus is really especially on kind of trust dynamics um, and so so anyways so we kind of the first step uh, for us has really been to just kind of look at what are the main elements and constructs that we need to kind of um, focus on. And from there, what we do is then we use that to kind of build out a test bed um, where we know that we're kind of ideally um, getting at a lot of these factors, right? So um, one, let's see if I can give you guys a good example. Um, well, we'll say trust and reliance is like listed here at the bottom here. But you know, if trust, if reliance, you know, reliance is really tied to trust. And if I trust someone, they're not necessarily the same thing, but they overlap a lot. But it was important when we built out our test bed that um, the people we be able to measure times when they rely on one another, for example. And so, anyways, this so point is that it ends up the framework ends up kind of being um, being used when you build out a test bed. So this is very much in the pilot stages also, and, and I have a little video clip where I'll show you. Um, what we're doing here, but some of the things what we ended up doing is um, there's actually this huge uh, crime mapping database that the Denver Police Department um, almost every month they put out all the crimes that have occurred, you know, around the Denver area. And what we've done is we've built kind of a our own custom test bed, and the idea is um, you're working with another human. And then you also are assisted by an AI agent. And what you're trying to do is you're given a question that says, um, please place pins on a map like uh, uh, for a certain date. So in this example, it says October 31st, 20, 20, 2019. And um, so what the what each person does is they go back and they look at the crimes that have occurred. And there's all these different types of crimes. So there's you know, there's like probably 10 different, you can kind of see the different crime layers. Sorry, it's not a great image. I blew it up a, a bunch, it looks like. But anyways, there's different types of layers, right? Um, if it was, if there was larceny or a robbery, or there's also just a lot of, you know, nonviolent offenses. So there's, um, you know, things like, car, you know, car accidents and, you know, and um, so so there's, there's all these different layers. Um, and what people are told is that they have two types of resources that they can place pins um, for resources. So a green resource um, is more for nonviolent crimes. So green resource would be, we say it's just like placing cameras, you know, uh, play surveillance, you know, kind of things like you don't even need humans to be there. And ideally, if there's gonna be a lot of nonviolent, so like traffic accidents, you know, or, or DUIs, for example, um, you could potentially just place you know, cameras at a certain location. Um, the red red pins are for first responders and that's supposed to be more for the violent crime layers, so murder, aggravated assault, things like that. Um, but anyway, so the, the way the test bed works is um, if you're given a date like October 31st, 2019, uh, you're able to search through these crime databases to try to see where crimes have occurred, but we, purposefully keep out that one date, the target date, you will never, you know, we pull out all information from October 31st because we don't want you to see the answer. Um, and so 
anyway, so the people know that, you know, they're, they're searching for everything, but they can never see that date. So they can look at every other piece of information, just not that date. Um, then they place their pins, you know, with their, their teammates and the AI is there to support them as well. And at the end, we tie their compensation uh, to the actual crimes that occurred on that date. So at the very end, when they've placed their pins, we'll show them, okay, well, here were the actual crimes on October 31st, 2019. Um, and the reason I'm going into detail to tell you guys that is, um, is that for a lot of these tasks, especially if you're trying to look at trust dynamics, um, the task has to feel meaningful to people. And I don't know, for those who've looked at affect, like, um, emo you know, you want to have emotions occur, let's say in experiments, it can be really hard to get a bunch of undergrads to come in and to actually feel the emotion that you want them to feel in your experiment, because they just want to get their 20 bucks and go. Like, they're like, how long am I here? One hour? Okay, I'm ready to leave. And so, so we really carefully constructed this task because we wanted to be, they, they basically make extra money based on how well they did. And so if you've got, you know, another participant that's a dud and not playing well, you actually feel that in your, you know, in your pocket when you leave, right? So, so anyway, so, but a lot of thought went into making sure also that there wasn't going to be a high learning curve. And another issue in experiments, if you really want to have authentic emotions, um, one issue too, is that sometimes people come in and you overwhelm them with instructions and then they sit there for an hour and they hardly know what they're, you know, they're like doing their best, but it's not like they are, they're able to even be fully engaged because they're still getting caught up to the task. And so we picked this task also because it's kind of an easy one for people to, you know, most people know how to do spatiotemporal kind of searching, um, you know, and so anyways, so th this is, uh, I think here I'll show you. <laughs> So this is a, a, a clip I'll show you guys. And I think you it, we're still piloting this. And one thing to notice, you'll, you'll notice that the AI basically like interrupts them multiple times. Like right now we have a kind of, an, kind of a scripted AI setup. And, um, and so it's been interesting to pilot this because we're clearly changing things as we, as we go. But anyway, so I think you'll find it interesting. The AI is more of a pest than anything, which of course is not what we want. So. Our latest is that um, we're making so well. I'll tell you about it afterwards. What we're trying to do, but um, and the actual experimental design. What we're really looking at is um, AI transparency and reliability. So um, transparency of an AI agent has been really like tied to trust quite a bit in the literature. And so the idea is um, one thing when a lot of people think about um, transparency of an AI agent, you know, it, the idea is there's someone named John Lee who he has the three P's of, um, of transparency, which is purpose, process, and performance. And there are others that would, you know, disagree and put their own definitions and theories. But the point is, it's like the AI system, it shouldn't just, you know, place a pin and say, you know, and not tell you why it placed a pin. It should place a pin and tell you I am placing a pin here because I noticed a lot of, you know, crimes in this area. Um, and so, you know, so it's giving you that, that transparency on not just what it's doing, but why it's doing it and what are its goals, you know, like um, for doing that. So, um, so in this experiment, the way we're setting it up is that the, the AI could have high transparency where it explains its process versus low transparency where it just places pins. And so we're curious to see, um, you know, the literature suggests that people really trust the high transparency, you know, um, AI more. And then reliability is an important element too. So um, I think when we talk about trust, we always think the default is to think that you're supposed to just always trust the AI agent, but that can also cause complacency, which can cause huge human, you know, that there can be fatalities or like, you know, terrible human error if you're over-reliant on AI. So it's also important if the AI is really not, not performing well, that's a time where the, the human should be able to notice that and, and calibrate their trust properly. So it's not always, the goal isn't always blind trust. The, the goal is properly calibrated trust, you know? And so anyway, so there's a fine line there, but I'll show you this, this somewhat blooper reel. Oh, and these are two students in my lab and they're very good sports because again, they're, they're trying to interact and the AI like keeps, keeps bothering them. Started. Awesome. So it looks like we're looking at May 5th um, for 2019.
uh, on my map, I'm seeing. Uh, Hello, I am an AI people. agent. I will be assisting your team on this task by placing pins. Awesome. Sweet. So we have an AI agent helping us out. Um, what I'm seeing on my screen are aggravated assault and arson. Um, and uh, and that's a lot by Civic Center Park. I used to live right by there, so it doesn't really surprise me. It's kind of a, a squirrely area. So I'm going to go ahead and place um, a pin that covers there and also slightly to the east. What are you seeing on your map, Lucas? Yeah, I'm seeing the same. I'm seeing a high concentration of larceny and theft. Um, really concentrated around the areas you've placed those pins. Um, additionally, I might place a pin near a high concentration to the south uh, along I-25 near this I am placing a pin where I have calculated an 84% probability of vehicle theft and arson based on data from past years. Great. Excellent. Yeah, so I see your pin down to the south. Mm -hmm. I-25, I also see the AI's pin yep. uh, just between District 2 and 3. Yep. So I won't, um, so anyways, that you can see that the AI, we had to, we're, we've been working to tweak it. Now it just gives kind of a little, a little ding, you know, and then it show and it places the pin and it shows the text, but it doesn't actually read the text. Um, so we'll see how that goes in our next round of pilots. But um, I, I, la I enjoy this video because my, the students are being good sports and trying to, to work together, despite the fact that the AI is more of a, a pest, I think, um, than anything else in this case. Um, so anyway, so this is the test bed that we're kind of currently, and it's definitely still being piloted because there, there's some tweaks to work out, but it's, it's been fun to work on. Um, so let me go next. So I'll quickly just say to wrap it up, um, eventually we want to build um, kind of a reinforcement learning system around this so that, um, you know, that you would be able to tell these, you know, these social cognitive affective states of the different team members using our sensors, but then ultimately that you, you know, make some sort of action, you know, in real time um, based on those states. And so some interesting, you know, things to work on. So for those who work in reinforcement learning, it's like, um, you can't have a gazillion states, you know, that you're looking at and, there, you know, it, be, it becomes an intractable problem very quickly. And so we're trying to figure out, um, you know, maybe if we're looking more at like um, just three states, kind of like all good, overloaded and, you know, off task kind of blue, you know, almost like red, green, blue. But, but anyways, we're playing around with different things. Like what can we, what could we predict with our sensors? Um, it would be meaningful to build into a POM VP, for example. And then, you know, there's the, the actions, you know, we have to figure out, you know, should we do some form of task shedding, you know, so you can say, oh, you're overloaded. I'm going to take one of your crime layers, for example, and I'll give it to someone else or I'll give it to the agent. So we're playing around with that. And it's, it's fun because this, it's, uh, I don't know, a lot of interesting problems we're, we're working our way through now. I won't go into, I'm kind of, um, want to make sure we have some time for questions. So um, just want to show one slide for another project we're doing. Um, and this is with the Air Force Academy. So here um, they actually have um, a new training program. Uh, and it's not just the Air Force, it's actually rolled out across um, kind of the Department of Defense um, where they're actually trying, it's called Pilot Training Next. And they're, um, the goal is to train pilots in VR and you know, and you can have them run through scenarios, you know, a, a bunch of times, and then you bring them up to actually fly. And so they'll learn things in the classroom and you can step them through things in the VR setting. And then, you know, it's, it becomes much more meaningful and efficient then to bring them into the actual plane to try out things that they have done. And so, um, so one of the things we're working on with the Air Force is really is to have, um, you know, people with physio sensors. So we, we actually have built out, they have, uh, you know, you can kind of see these custom setups they have at the academy here. And this is actually where the cadets go and train. And so we actually have really wearable, um, kind of a suite of sensors that we have people wearing. And we're trying to, um, initially we were trying to predict workload, um, which we still are, and that's relatively straightforward, but they're actually really interested also in sim sickness. So for those of you that work in VR, um, Apparently, this is a big problem for the cadets and for people training in general is that, um, you know, there are so many different factors that will cause sim sickness. So 
So we're really, we're also pivoting to try to see if we can use our sensors to predict the onset of it, you know, before, before sim sickness would occur. Um, so anyway, so, and then ultimately um, the interest is there's something called Viper, which um, they have, they're integrating it into this pilot training next platform. The idea is that they want to have an intelligent, you know, instructor that helps assist the cadets, you know, while they're training. So, anyway, so that's a fun kind of project that we have going also. Um, and I'll quickly, I do want to tell you guys, um, I'll give you kind of the three minute spiel, but like um, we, you know, we're very, very excited that we have just kicked off this, um, this new AI Institute. So it's based at, here at, at ICS. Um, ISAT, we just decided on the acronym. We had to go back and forth on that. Um, but the, you know, the, the main goal is um, very similar to a lot of the research I've showed you is like um, now we have students and they're learning, they're learning content. Usually it tends to be STEM content. Um, and, but the idea is it's very much based on 21st century learning. So 21st century learning is really um, pushing the idea that um, students should be working in small groups and it's very much like a team, you know, and, and that they should be engaging in critical thinking. They should be listening to one another. They should be having enough self-efficacy to, to kind of know that they're, each person contributes a different point of view and that together they can Kind of problem solve and work their way through things. So it's kind of um. So it's very much like similar to to teaming in the human performance domain. Um, anyway, so what what we're looking at the kind of big picture goal is that you have some sort of um, you know AI system could have different embodiments. Could be a robot. Could be like an Alexa, a disembodied voice. Um, you know, but it's they're kind of helping facilitate um, the, the student learning in the classroom. So again, I won't, you guys, I list the, um, I list the website for the Institute at the end here. So please check it out. And, um, but, but I will tell you that we have, um, I'm kind of on the strand two, I'm co-lead of strand two, which is very much the human computer interaction kind of piece. Um, strand three is a lot of the education folks, the people that develop the curriculum and they, they work with teachers. And so they, they um, develop a lot of great, especially STEM curriculum units. Um, and strand one is, I don't know if you guys know Martha Palmer, who's, um, in the CS department, but it's a, it's a lot of the natural language processing and discourse analysis. And, and so they're really handling a lot of the, um, the technical piece of building out the AI. And so we kind of play this role, uh, the HCI folks, of we, we kind of um, play this role between the two groups um, to kind of bridge the gap in the research. Um, but one um, we're kind of, one of the things we're working on is also looking at, um, you know, developing frameworks, as I've showed you guys a few frameworks today, but developing frameworks um, that help us to understand what are the kind of skills and behaviors that are important in these student teams. Um, but also we're trying to figure out, um, you know, what should the AI look like? You know, what is it, what are the different embodiments? Uh, are we taught, you know, we want to look at an avatar versus a robot versus, you know, our, our voices. Does it matter if it's female, male voice? And, um, you know, but but these are all different things that we're kind of considering. We're going to be running a lot of experiments, but this is definitely an area um, where we had a meeting last week, and I said I was doing this talk, and everyone was like, "Ask the Atlas folks if they have ideas on embodiments and on you know." And so, anyways, wanted to do like that shout out there. Um, and then, of course, we're doing a lot of studies in the, the classroom, and ultimately, we'll have people in a bunch of sensors while they're working together. But in the end, we have to transfer to classroom environments um, where all we really can hope to have is, is video and microphone you know, for the students. And so, um, so classroom transfer is a big piece. And anyways, and, and this is right now we have a sensors unit, which is an existing unit where kids learn how to program and they, it's like a drag and drop programming environment. And so right now we're taking the, this kind of existing sensors curriculum unit um, and we are embedding it into kind of a test bed um, where we can run studies in the lab. And, um, and that's kind of where the work is right now. And um, yeah, so it's, it's really fun. And we are absolutely looking for, um, you know, students that are interested in getting involved with the Institute. We've got some really cool, um, cool elements of the research we're working on now. And um, so please shoot me an email um, if, if anyone is kind of intrigued by what we're doing at, at the Institute and wants to get involved. And that's, uh, my spiel, I went a little over, but not too bad. So, so thanks, and yeah, I'm happy to take any questions.
Well, good. I don't feel as bad for going over. <laughs> hi, Leanne. Uh, thank you so hey. much for your oh, talk. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, very insightful, and it was really great to see all the different types of work that you do. Um, thank you so much for your input. Um, my okay. main question, of course, um, my main question is mostly on the learning side of things. I know that you talked a bit about um, measuring workload um, is well, with respect to the FNIRS machinery. And I was just kind of wondering how, aside from like AI incorporation, how one would think about learning or potentially um, kind of on the, the motor pattern side of whether or not people are actually incorporating or learning from the particular systems that you give them. So, okay, so it's more of a, a learn it. So you're wondering if they're actually learning then, like as opposed to just workload, you're wondering if we have ways to track the, the, the learning experience. Is that, did I get your question? Kind of, is that the, because I have an answer, but I want to make sure I've got. Um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Just because you're saying that you can measure how intense something is for someone's working memory load. And obviously, maybe over time, you could assess learning or something like yeah. that. Um, but yeah. I was just wondering so it's a great, how you approach it. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's an area we, I know some of, we haven't, um, definitely, especially with the AI Institute, um, this is something we talk about a lot that it's, you know, you have um, the workload states are things that you're measuring the here and now, but what about those longer term effects and, and learning outcomes in particular? Um, there definitely is research, for example, um, it's been pretty heavily found that when you develop expertise, um, your brain activation starts to slowly move back in the brain. So as something becomes more automatic, um, at the beginning, when you're a newbie, a novice, you'll have more you know, cognitive load and you'll have more activation during a task right, right up front. Um, and then over time with the same task, you will have activation that, move, that moves towards the back um, and as things become more automatic. So that's like that's one um, one thing. Certainly, I know you're interested also, like in the the music and jam sessions and and in good teams. And I'm so excited that my um, my students had a great time meeting with, with you guys. Um, but also, there's some really great. You know, we have to dig in more of this, but there's great um, there's great literature on as you do kind of like learn over time or start to get more comfortable in a team. Um, you may have more activation in, in regions that are related to kind of um, whether it's creativity. So you're not like, you don't have as much workload and you're able to focus on the creativity piece, for example. And so there are brain regions that are more, um, you know, associated with the creative processes, for example. And so you might also see that over time, you know, as kind of an outcome as you learn that you're able to, instead of being maxed out here, you're able to have other um, brain regions that are kind of involved um, you know, with the process because you're not so maxed out. So that's another thing that comes to mind anyways. Yeah, thank you for that. That's exactly what I was wondering. Yeah. Well, just to follow up. So if you say, if we are talking about um, maybe teamwork, right? Or the trust. Mm -hmm. And so over the time, do you, you actually see people, whatever the signal is moving to the back? That's interesting. So I'm not saying you should yeah. do, but that just got me thinking about whatever the prisoner <laughs> um, mm -hmm. experiment. What if we got total stranger, but somehow giving them the task and see how how fast or how easy do they get to trust each other? If they have, if they are stuck in the yes. escape room, they have to break it out, right? So they yeah. don't away. Yes. Or yeah, if yeah, they're yeah. being given the task that everybody would be, <laughs> sorry, that sounds mean, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I wonder how that will be because I think sometimes we, we do we do break our room and put students in team all the time. And sometimes the first five minutes it is the icebreaker. They're trying to figure out like, can I work with you? Or do they jump yeah. to another break room to decide how do they trust? Who, who should be their partner? Yeah. That's interesting. I'd love to actually, so, and there's, um I'd love to hear more about that too, because absolutely, that's definitely kind of up our alley as far as an interest. But, but yeah, there's this whole area, um, Swift Trust. There's this, you know, that's, um, that's, you know, heavily studied now in the IO site kind of human factors domains. But, but definitely, there are, you know, techniques that have been shown that if you do have a new team, there are definitely techniques you can use to kind of like have your best shot at, at initially giving everyone some level of trust. Um, but absolutely, I think like. Um, 
in a lot of our studies and the, the Army one, the one with the crime mapping test bed, we really want to have a longitudinal aspect to it also and try, you know, like um, trying to look at how different teams kind of unfold over time. And if you bring back the same, you know, teams and maybe, you know, you have teams that were more successful versus teams that were less successful, what happens if you continue to bring them back and kind of track them? And so I think the longitudinal piece is like fascinating. And then, as you say, to then for the same group of people to see what's the difference in the brain activity from session one to session 10 to session 20, you know, like, and maybe when did you finally see a team that wasn't doing well? When did they like finally have a change maybe in their brain activity that related also to their team performance, you know, like in their survey measures, because of course we always give a bunch of survey measures. Um, yeah, it's an interesting, very interesting question. I'd love to hear more about um, that at some point also actually. I, I, lo I love escape rooms. Have me as a subject. <laughs> well, if there's, um, you know, feel free also after this to um, feel free to reach out, email me if anyone wants. We're always happy to have others join. Oh, and I see Jean maybe has a, I have a, a question. question. Your, your, your conversation with Torin um, made me think about uh, some of the work I'm doing uh, related to uh, visual expertise and the transformative learning experience. So I have uh, um, I teach a class on flow visualization. Students are in a lab, their work or, or just their kitchens actually, and they're working with gases and liquids and doing photography and video. How com how comfortable or is your apparatus actually? Is it portable? Um, and would it work in this kind yeah. of really unstructured environment? Yeah, I, and absolutely. So it is, it's completely portable. Um, and, you know, uh, and it's, it's quite comfortable to wear. And also, I would say that, um, depending on the population for younger, you know, um, you may want, you know, we can choose how many channels we have and what the configuration is. And so we might, for example, if, if comfort was a big concern, though, maybe you'd say, well, let's not put them in a full head configuration. You know, we only care about you know, here and here, you know, so maybe, so you could pick out a montage too that wasn't quite as cumbersome, um, but absolutely like the device is completely portable and naturalistic people, it has an accelerometer built in and then a couple of other um, tweaks that I won't get into that, that help you to remove motion artifacts from the data. So really people are able to, um, you know, and for the AI Institute, for example, um, you know, we're really, it's gotta be, students are gonna be working together and they need to have a reasonable range of motion, you know, and they, they're they programming, they're grabbing things on the screen. And so absolutely like that's, um, I'd love to chat more like, um, cause that, that's definitely something that we, uh, that we could do and we have the right equipment for it, for sure. Cool. All right, it's, it's really fascinating technology. I'd not, I'd not seen it before. Great. Thanks. Yeah, it's been neat to see it develop over the years. Well, thank, thank you guys again, um, uh, you know, for, for hosting me and this has been super fun. And, um, and like I said, I, I would love, feel free to email me, the Institute especially, we'd love to get some Atlas folks uh, playing around in the research space. And um, so absolutely, you know, so, so please, uh, you have my info now. So anyone feel free to reach out. Take I'm care. <clears throat> Bye. Thanks. Thanks again, Ellen. This was fun. Yes.